Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, and some say you're, you know, one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you, my disciples, who do you, you brave 12, you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, notice, it wasn't John, wasn't James, wasn't Bartholomew wasn't any of the other. It was Simon Peter who answered and said, you are the Christ. You're the Christ. You're son of God who lives. And Jesus answered in return and said, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, or Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And by the way, Peter, also I say to you, your name is Petra, or Peter, for you are a rock. And on this rock, I will build. I will build. You say that with me. I will build. Come on, say that with me. I will, what? Build. Now, not only that, but I will build my church. Whose church? Whose church? God's church. Whose church? One more time. Whose church? Good. And the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against it. I, I'd, I'd like to take some time to introduce not only today's message, but I'd like to take some time to introduce to you this series. <clears throat> I can count on one hand the number of highly important series we've had in 29 years of the existence of this church. I can count on one hand the number of series that I would classify as highly, highly, highly important. I'd rank this in the top five. I really would. We've taken a year to transition. We've taken a year to adjust. We've taken a year to acclimate. And now it's time to get to work. It's really time to cut through the clutter, cut through the excuses, cut through all of the post-COVID casualties and casualties, put our hands on the plow, and get back to work. Being that church, that God had always and has continually called this church to be. We're building something special in the North Lake area beyond blueprints. And let me just say this, because I know someone is going to go home thinking this is a building campaign speech. I, I, I just know it. No matter how much I try to avoid it, no matter how much I try not to say it, somebody's going to go home thinking we're talking about brick and mortar. Uh, we're not talking about brick and mortar. Please, I am having a free life right now I'm not worrying about brick and mortar. Do you understand me? When it rained cats and dogs this past Thursday, I said, God, thank you for the rain. And I didn't have to think one time about a roof in Huntersville, North Carolina. That's a whole other message. But nevertheless, let me get back on target here. And so that being said, beyond blueprints, building plans, and brick and mortar, we're building a special house for a special purpose and a special reason. We're building a spiritual house, in fact, Please stay with me. We're building God's house. Say that with me. We're building God's house. And so for the next few weeks here at City Church, North Lake, I want to lay out a very clear and a very concise plan on how we can not only just work on the house of God and building God's spiritual house, but I want to talk about what it means to advance the church, what it means to advance the community, and what it means to advance the kingdom, the church the community, and advance the Great Commission. Now, um, I'm going to be old-fashioned today. It's kind of one of those messages, if you notice in Scripture, for those of you that really read the Bible, you'll notice in Scripture, Paul makes a statement. He says, I hope that you can bear with my scruples. I hope that you can put up with my folly. He's, he's being a little narcissistic. He's being a little passive-aggressive. But what he's saying is, I hope you all can put up with my... Um, rascalities. I, I, I'm going to get it in my feelings a little bit today, and I hope you all can deal with that. All right? I'm going to be all over the place just for a moment, but I pray you all have grace enough for me to be a pastor today and not a motivational speaker. Allow me to be a good pastor that loves you and cares for you and warns you, and not just a Sunday morning hiring. Okay? So would you all put up with my scruples today? Is that all right? Would you all put up with my folly today? All right, real good. Let's get started. So here's what I want to do. These next few Sundays, and I'm also going to include Thursday nights, 
These next two Sundays and Thursday nights, we're going to look at a wayward woman who waits to the hottest hour of the day to get water from a well. We'll look at a, a, a very prominent businessman, a nobleman, if you would, who's got everything he could ever want, but yet he comes to Jesus wanting his son to be healed. Throughout this series, we'll, we'll look at another woman. She's got seven demons who've been cast out of her. But for whatever reason, God chooses to use her, even in the backdrop of men, 11 of them, who want to be world-changing pastors, he uses her with her bad rap and her bad street cred and, 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 and be one of the first people to see Jesus after the resurrection. And we're not sure of all of the whys, but while those men were trying to figure life out, she saw the Messiah and she announces to the new world, I mean the world, that the Savior has risen. We'll look at a couple who's a power couple. Boy, what a power team. But instead of being overachievers, they were underachievers. They'd overpromised and underdelivered. And so through this series, there's a lot of moving parts and narratives. But what they all have in common is this. God looked past their faults, looked past their weaknesses, looked past their past, and he decides to use them. There's a reason for this. Now, let me give you a couple of highlights. I think you'll be excited about some of the things that are developing in this season. Number one, during this series and during this season, we're preparing and planning for a great Labor Day weekend. Some of you all will travel on Labor Day weekend, but then again, many of you all will not. We're going to take that September 3rd Sunday and make it a, a joyous, celebratory friends and family day. Next week, we'll have a flyer. You'll see all the festivities. We'll have an outdoor baptism service that day. So anyone who wants to be water baptized, we're going to have it male and female, I might add. All right. Now, listen, um, it's going to be a unique baptismal service. It's going to be a lot of fun, but I tell you right now, it's going to be a beautiful time. Thank you for the flyer, by the way. Um, we'll come back the following Sunday. It's going to be NFL cookoff Sunday. Um, we don't have a home game, so you ain't got nowhere else to be. So guess what? We're going to wear our favorite jerseys. We're going to have some fun, and uh, we might even tailgate a little bit. But we're going to take September and make it a really festive, celebratory, fun month. Then the following Sunday, we don't stop. No, there's no rest for the weary. It's National Back to Church Sunday around the country. You've got family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, cousins. You've got a lot of people who you may not even want to invite them, but they're going to invite themselves because they feel somewhat kind of out the way and coming back to church. Well, out of the 800-plus churches in Charlotte, why not here? And so it's going to be a great time. We'll close out the month with our 29th Founders Conference and church anniversary. It's going to be a great, great week, a great month for the city church. Now, um, a couple of things that I want to add to that is I feel really impressed to start or relaunch. I'm going to call this a 20-minute drive time prayer conference call every Thursday. We won't start it yet. Give me a couple of weeks to work on it. But I want to do a, a, a conference. I want to do a 20-minute, and we, we want to call it drive time because it's going to be 8 a.m. And we just want to open a phone line just for prayer for 20 minutes. Most of you all will be transitioning to work, at the airport, whatever you're doing, 8 a.m., join us for prayer. It's not mandatory by any means, but I want to build that sense of congruency and companion and commonality among everybody. If you join, you join. If you don't, no problem. But I want to make sure that we keep consciously in our heads that all that we are trying to attempt to do cannot be done if we're not building and bathing this in prayer. Would you agree with me? Would you agree with me? Right? All right. This beautiful digital wall, and I can't thank this media team enough because my biggest fear is a lot of churches, they'll go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars for this wall, and they don't do nothing but put a title up, and that's it. We don't have that problem. We have a tremendous media team, and they are maximizing this wall to death. <laughs> so thank you all for that. One of the things I look forward to doing, we're going to take this series, and throughout the series, how many of y'all remember the prayer wall we used to have in Huntersville and at Oasis? I think we even had it at Old Concord Road. We used to put up a big old black wall, and you would pin your pictures to that. Y'all remember the prayer wall we had? Well, guess what? We live in a digital AI world now, so you ain't got to bring your pictures no more. Just email us your picture, right? And we're going to have this big wall with nothing but pictures of people you want to pray for, right? So if you got a son, a daughter, a cousin, a coworker, maybe it's a new home, maybe it's a, whatever it is you need prayer about, send it us up. Uh, and I don't know what app we can use, but I'm sure out there somewhere there's a mosaic, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there is a, um, 
uh, what's that word? Uh, collage? That the word? Collage? There's a collage app where you can put a whole, y'all know how it is the Panthers game when they put all the social media pics up and all the pictures up. So we want to keep pictures of people that we're praying for continually before us continually before so throughout the series the next few weeks in the Thursday night services the Sunday morning services you'll see all of the pictures just continually going why because it is a reminder that we're praying for salvation we're praying for healing we're praying for deliverance everybody okay with that somebody say amen, amen. all right just want to make sure everybody's okay so we're going to start with these different things today I want to talk to you about having a heart for the house having a heart of the house having a heart of the house let me give credit what credit is due elder hall and i had a little meeting a little brunch not brunch but a little, little snack uh, at panera bread this past uh i don't know if it's tuesday or wednesday which i often don't really have time to do often but we had that time together and we were talking about the church we were talking about ministry and somewhere in that conversation an organic statement came up i don't know if he said it first or if i said it first but we said having a heart for the house and I said man that a preach right there little did I know and I said let's pause hold tight dude I wrote it down right there on the spot little did I know that'd be the message for this coming Sunday I didn't think I'd preach this so soon but it resonated with me so then I couldn't escape that thought all week long and the Holy Spirit reminded me and he began to deal with me all throughout the week there's the missing link that's the problem we've got skills we've got people We've got degrees and we've got knowledge and we've got resources and we've got friendships. But what happened to the heart of the house? The first scripture came to mind was 1 Samuel 14. You don't have to turn there. 1 Samuel 7, I think it is. You don't have to turn there. But when the armor bearer tells Jonathan, uh, listen, hey, do all that is in thine heart for I am with you. My heart is with you. I thought about the Bible says in 2 Samuel 3, 1, that the house, the house, the house, of Saul grew weaker and weaker and weaker, but the house of David grew stronger and stronger. And I said, God, there it is. We need a heart for the house. And there's a distance, and there's this ongoing, continual rift and distance. And it's subtle, by the way. It's not obvious. It's not overt. But little by little by little by little by little, we're removing ourselves from the entrance and the things of God's house. And you know what? Please forgive me for saying this. I don't blame you. We are living in a survival world right now. People have job insecurity. We've got inflation. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get this paid and get that done and get this done. I read an article the other day, and it just talks about how this generation of church people, we're not like it used to be where community meant something to us. We are now trading community for careers. And so it's no longer about the community of one another, as we saw in Acts chapter 2. As our forefathers saw in the civil rights days, or even during slavery days, for us, it's career over community. Now, that being said, it's now more about advancement, right, over, or let me say this, it's isolation and independence over being together and it's not your fault that is just the culture that is the the trajectory and the wave we're in and so these things being said the Holy Spirit's been dealing with my heart so not just for today but for this season and I'm gonna tell you right now you're gonna hear three times before I close here's the first time the greatest heart for the house can always be seen in three things your giving right your attendance and your participation your giving, your attendance, and your participation. Now, if I had to come for men and just straight men only, I was in and out yesterday watching the, the, uh, the uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremony and the speeches, and I'm familiar with a couple of them uh, by way of family or friends who are here in Charlotte, and then the other one, Rondé Barber, his father it was, was my dean and employer at Oral Roberts University, and I noticed all throughout his speech, not one time did he mention his daddy. Not one time. He even went on to say, I grew up in a home without a father, so I'm going I'm to mention all these other guys in the room. And boy, my heart was cut because I know his father. I don't know what happened, what went on, but I said, wow. 
how empty that must feel. How terrible that must feel. We need community. Men are receiving the greatest achievement in a lifetime. But can I look over to the corner and see that? We need community. We need healing. And I know it's, I got it numbing my cell phone. What are you saying? We want to be at a place where we can be relevant in ministry. All throughout the weekend, three things kept coming up. Be on time, work hard, and have a good attitude. I kept hearing that again and again and again and again. Be on time. They said Belichick would say that. They said Parcells would say that. They said Dungey would say that. All of these great Hall of Fame coaches, they all say the same thing. Be on time, work hard, and have a good attitude. And I said, man, as simple as that sounds, how much more could that be applied to the church? Having a heart for the house. Let's move forward. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got to move fast because I have a lot of material and, I, and, I'm, and, and we, we're disciplining ourselves to be more time conscious. I won't rest and I will not be satisfied until every square inch of this room has chairs in it. Not just once a Sunday. Not just twice on Sundays, but I'm now at the level of seeing three times on the weekend. Maybe two on Sundays, one on Saturday. Maybe two on Sundays, one on Thursday. I don't know just yet. But what I know is this, the Holy Spirit won't lie to me. The same grace that I saw at 7829 Old Concord Road, the same grace that was at East 10th Street, First Ward Elementary School, the same grace that was at 604 Doug's made, the Oasis. The same grace that was in Huntersville. It's the same grace from God that is in this place. We've been through a storm internally. We've been through a COVID storm externally. But we're still here. And there's got to be a reason. God, I, let me tell you something. That same cell phone I got, I could go down the line and show you churches and pastors that started 29, 25, 20, 15, 10 years ago, and they're no longer here. Why are we still here? Didn't have half the challenges. Didn't have a tenth of the obstacles. Why did God keep the remnant and the nucleus. Let's move. God builds the house, but he also gives a grace for every good work. Bible says in Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, their labor is in vain who builds it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Is that right? 2 Corinthians 9, 8. I just want you to hear this. And God is able to make all grace, all grace. Say that with me, all grace. Notice this, all grace abound towards you so that you would have the sufficiency in all things that you would have an abundance for every good work. Stay with me. God said, listen, I'm going to give you something that you don't have so you can have some good things going on in your life. So every business owner in the room, God says, I got something special for you if you want it. All right, no matter what your trade, no matter what your career, no matter what your path or what you got going on in your home, God says, if you're willing to receive it, I will give you something special, something spiritual, something you cannot get off of Google, you cannot get in the classroom. I will give you a grace, a power, an authority, an access for every good work. And I hear him saying the same thing for the church, right? So that being said, God builds the house. He gives the grace. But brothers and sisters, you got to have the heart. He can't give you that. He can't give you that. He can give you uh, an, an anointing, yes. He can give you grace, yes. He can give you the ability, yes. But you got to have the heart. 
You got to have the heart. That being said, let's go back to look at Peter because we see something about Peter and we see something in his heart. Now, in our text this morning, Matthew 16, 13, you, you already know this backdrop. You should know this backdrop already. But, but for those that are new and those that are online and maybe you don't know, real easy. Jesus purposely goes to Caesarea Philippi, not Caesarea on the coast where we were. Caesarea Philippi is about two hours north of Galilee. It's in a beautiful plush garden this area but it was also an area known for idol worship statues and figurines and all type of false greek gods were all over the place so he purposely goes there and in the midst of all of these false gods and statues he said hey guys who am i to you who am i to you well you know uh, you know well, you know see what happened well you know i kind of well see what, what i'm trying to say is oh listen who am i to you all right and it was peter the least likely in the room the one that all of us would have counted out and said, no, not him. Why? Because he cusses. Why? Because he's got anger management issues. Why? Because he's got a rage problem. Why? He's passive aggressive. You know what? I've been thinking about Peter lately, and I said, now, if Peter was living today, we, 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 we'd label him bipolar. We would, because we don't know what's coming. Peter got a lot of stuff going on in his head. He's all over the place. We might even say he's a little schizophrenic, because when he's with this crowd, he acts a certain way. Then he's with that crowd, he acts another way. Paul pulls him to the side and says, Peter, you are a hypocrite. Isn't that something? We don't do that today, right? Because folk will leave the church if we call them one another out like that. But that's a whole other message right now. But, but, but Jesus says, Peter, you know what? My father has been spending time with your crazy self. And he reveals something, not to your head, but he shows you something in the heart. You may be all over the place in your head, but your heart is right. You may have some problems and some frailty and some issues. Somebody say issues. You may have some issues and you may have some challenges, but your heart is right. Are y'all still with me? Are you still with me? Uh, it kind of reminds me of, of, uh, of Samuel. You remember when, when God goes to anoint David and Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Just write it down. 1 Samuel 16, 7. David goes to Samuel and says, Samuel, look here, man. I'm getting ready to anoint me a new king, right? And Samuel said, would you look at all these tall, dark-skinned, and handsome men? They got good hair. They got green eyes. They got smooth skin. And I'm telling you, these are, these are the real deal guys. And, and God says, Samuel, quit looking at the outward appearance, for I see the heart of a man. Uh, may I remind some of you all, quit looking at the outside of folk and quit looking at the outside of people, what they drive, how they dress, what they look. God said, I'm looking at the heart of a man. Why? Because if it's up to we and me and you, we look at all of the external, and that can be so deceiving and so deceptive. But God said, I'm looking through those things because there's something in the heart of David. Right? It's a heart thing. And so, in short, Peter had issues going on all in his head, but he was all over the place. He was all, he, was, he had stuff going on in his head, all over the place in his head, but God saw his heart. Now, I, I wanna segue to another thought because it's the same Peter, we're gonna fast forward for a moment. It's the same Peter that years later, the prophecy comes to pass. Not only did God build his church on him, but he advances the church upon the life of Peter. Well, not only do we see this happening in church, but we now see it happen in community. Say community. It happens in community. Would you take your Bible, go to Acts chapter 5. I want to show you something about Peter in Acts chapter 5, okay? We're, we're talking about having a heart for the house. Now, it's 1225. I'm about halfway finished. I think we're doing pretty good with time. But I need you to go to uh, Acts chapter 5 because in Acts 5, speaking of heart and heart issues, let me show you what having a good heart will do for you as a member. But also, let me show you what having a bad heart or a messed up heart will do as a member. So Acts 5, and uh, everybody okay so far? Everybody all right? Ain't nobody mad at me so far. Everybody, everybody still good? Now, I've seen a couple of guys walk out. I want them to come on back in because these are our new future leaders, and I need them to be sitting down in place here in the Word of God and not get distracted with a whole bunch of stuff going on, okay? Now, Acts chapter 5. Here we go. Verse, let's start at verse 1. How about that? We don't read this often, but I think you'll enjoy the, the, the narrative here. But a certain man... Anytime you see in the Bible it says certain, that should cause you to stop, pause, and say, hmm, what's this all about? Okay, a certain man named Ananias, he had a wife, her name was Sapphira. And they, oh, by the way, sister Felicia, the name Ananias means one who God has been generous to. I, I never knew that until this week. One who God has been generous to. Had a wife, Sapphira, well, it comes from the word Sapphira, which simply means she was a red ruby in jewelry or uh, a precious metal. We know that already. They sold a possession, 
kept back part of the proceeds. And his wife also being aware of it, uh, they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter, here we go with Peter. Y'all remember Peter? Everybody remember Peter? Mm -hmm. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Notice the word heart. Why has Satan filled? What does Peter know about a heart? He knows a lot about hearts. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who did he lie to? Who did he lie to? Huh. And keep part of the price for the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it still not under your own control? Why have you conceived this thing where? In your heart. Are you all still with me? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but you lied to who? Don't y'all hear Peter talking? Well, he is a bad motor scooter. Don't y'all hear him talking? Can you, can you even place yourself on the scene for a moment? This Peter, he's a rough guy. He didn't lie to us. You lied to God. Oh, by the way, this wasn't no private therapy session one-on-one -on -one in a corner somewhere. There was no online virtual meet with a whole bunch of firewall. This was a public conversation. I will use them as an example, but it's so real, you would think I'm talking to you for real, and you walk out that door right now as I'm preaching, so I'm not even going to use that as an example. <laughs> Good grief. All right, let's go on. And, and, and Ananias, hearing these words, verse 5, fell down and breathed his last. And so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I told you it was a public gathering. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now, okay, about three hours later, how many hours later? That's how long it took for her to come back from the mall. Three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, hey, tell me, how much money did you say again you got for the land? And she said, yes, for this much. And then Peter said to her, uh, notice this question, how is it that you have agreed, wife, Wifey for lifey, how is it you agree, honey pie, sweetie? How is it that you agree together to test the spirit of the Lord? Would you look at the feet of those who buried your husband at the, at the door? They're all going to carry you out as well. Verse 10, and immediately she fell down at the feet and breathed her last. And the young men came and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her by her husband. Now, there's about 90% of people in this room who believe that it really happened, but there's always going to be 10% in the room who think you can outsmart God and you're more intelligent than the Bible. I believe that happened. Now, I'm going to have to help you in a few moments from a theological perspective because the question in your head is right now, and I'm no, I, know, I, know, I know how we as uh, uh, <clears throat> brothers and sisters think. Why would that be such a severe thing? Could it possibly have been so bad? I want to help you out in a moment. Let's, let's keep, let, let, let me just, let, let, let's talk about Ananias and Sapphira for a moment. Um, like Peter, watch this, here's a couple. They had all of the potential in the world. They were game changers, world overcomers, a true power couple that many of you all see on Netflix and you're watching all these reality shows, right? Uh, but they were self-centered. They were selfish, insecure. At best, they were underachievers. They'd overpromised and they had under-delivered. They overpromised but they underdelivered. Work with me and stay with me just for a moment. They were not being true to themselves and nor were they being true to God. I, I, I have to pause here. I have to pause just for a moment. Please stay with me. They were not being true to themselves nor were they being true to God. I said it once. Here's my second time. I'm going to say it a third time in a moment. Having a heart for the house means you will be generous in your giving. You will be consistent in your attendance and you'll be faithful in your participation. And I'm starting to wonder right now, can you honestly be true to those three benchmarks of having the heart for the house? We're going somewhere in this church and I need every deacon, every minister, every elder, every missionary, every mother, every couple, every single, every retiree, every corporate exec, every student, male, female, I need you to have a heart for the house. I would never ask this of you 
if I didn't give my heart to the house that I came up in in ministry as a college student, as a young adult. I wouldn't ask it of you if I didn't lead today by example. When I honored God this week with my giving, it was a painful reality. But I did it because I lead by example. And I don't want to be one who experiences a death. And you may say, oh, God's a God of grace. Certainly he wouldn't allow no one today to die like Ananias Sapphira. We may not physically die, but our dreams die. Our investments die. Our, 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 our goals and our ambitions, they begin to die and hemorrhage and get weak and fall and lose. Something that you thought was a slam dunk investment, real estate, now it's worth nothing. A business that you just knew that you knew that you knew was going to be all that and more. All of a sudden, somebody moves in next door to you or something happens in compliance and it's worth nothing. It's dead. And as Billy D. Williams would say back in the movie, what would it profit to gain everything you could ever want and have no one to celebrate it with? You've died emotionally. Some of the richest people in the world who have no joy and no love Stay with me. Please stay with me. I've come a long way to want to deliver this message on today. These people had personal gain, and now it was more important than God's plan. And maybe we need to ask ourselves the question this morning, is my personal gain more important than God's plan for my life? Maybe we should ask the question this way, selfish greed. And it was selfish greed in the face of sacrificial giving. The church was on a track do you understand? They were, they were, they, 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 they were on a plan. There was a, they were doing something special. What were we doing, by the way? By the way, the church in Acts 2 at that time, they were giving to other churches. They were giving to the poor. They were trying to sustain and help. They had a street cred. They had a reputation of hold. But there was a chink in the armor. I hope that's not a bad word to say, but there was a chink in the, oh, there was a, a crack in the armor. Let me say it that way, all right? That's the best way to say it. And, and, and there was a weak link, and it was hindering everyone. What do they call it, a fly in the ointment? It was a fly in the ointment. And as little and as insignificant one member might have been, it was disrupting the whole flow. That there, my brothers and sisters, lies the problem. It wasn't that they lied to man. They lied to God. It wasn't that they offended people. They offended the move of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're going to be an ABC Baptist church, or you in CDF Methodist Church, Icebox Cold Church, no life, no living, no nothing, you can get away with all that stuff. But if you subscribe, and I'm not against Baptist and Methodist, please don't get me wrong, I'm just having fun when I say that. But if you're going to be in a life-giving, breathing, anointed, grace, power, vision, moving, Holy Ghost, grace, church, you got to, listen, as the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. You got to make your call and election sure. Because there's now a raising of the bar and you're subscribing to something special. Let's go further. Uh, you might think that's too severe, but remember now, God is a God that doesn't change. There's nothing new under the sun. Let's go back to the Old Testament real quick, looking at my time. But I think there's an Old Testament reference very and very uniquely similar to Ananias and Sapphira. In fact, go back, uh, 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings. If you'll turn there, I'm going to try to get this out the way real quick. 2 Kings chapter 5. I want to show you something because, again, up until now, you may not have ever realized, and if you notice, notice, notice with me, not one time have I used the word tithe. Have you noticed that yet? Not one time have I used the word tithe. It wasn't about the tithe in Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. It was their reputation. It was their sacrifice. They went against the grain and hindered the flow of what the Holy Spirit was doing in the house. Let me show you another example. What did I say? Second Kings what? Can, uh, can you check on Brother Charles for me? I saw him step out. I don't know if he had to go, he come back or what, but I, he's very in instrumental in this service and in the music department meeting. Second Kings chapter 5. I just want to know. Second Kings 5. Now again, if, if, I hope I'm not insulting anybody with biblical literacy, but I'm going to assume someone doesn't know the story. I want you to look at 2 Kings chapter 5 and uh, 
It's a lot, but I, I'm going to try to short. Let me, let me give you the highlights, all right? How about that? Here go the highlights. <laughs> Here go the highlights. 2 Kings chapter 5 and uh, uh, verse 20. Here we go. Notice what the Bible says. Um, 5 and 20. Yeah. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, by God Almighty, right there alone, it scares me to death. Gehazi, the servant of Elijah. How many of y'all remember who Elijah was? And remember there was Elijah, and then there was Elisha. What do we know about Elisha? He gets the mantle from his dad, or from his spiritual father. Elisha, Elijah, the former, did seven major miracles. Elisha, because he got the double portion, did 14 historical major miracles. He's a bad dude as well. I mean, good God, he's, he's a very powerful prophet. And the Bible says he was a man of God. But notice what this servant did. Gehazi, the Bible says, verse 20, uh, says, look, my master has spared Naaman, the Syrian. Remember Naaman? He had, he had leprosy, and um, he was a great, powerful king, but at the same time, uh, he wanted to get healed, and the man of God said, go dip in the Jordan seven times, and he was so headstrong and so arrogant. How, how, how dare I go to the dirtiest ribbon in, in the area and dip? But God said, do it anyway, and he did it, and he got healed, thank God. So now he got healed and delivered. He's feeling real good about himself. He said, you know what? Man, what's, the least I could do is give him some money. And he, so he sent some money to Elijah, and Elijah said, no, no, I'm not taking no money from you. I'm good. We're straight. No need for the money. Hey, Gehazi, go back and tell Naaman we're straight. We don't need no money from nobody. We're good. We, we serve to the Lord, not to man. What did Gehazi do? He does the opposite. Let's read verse 21. So Gehazi pursues Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot and met him and said, is everything all right? And he said, yeah, well, yeah, mm, you know, well, see what happened was well, my master sent me saying, indeed, we now have two men, the sons of the prophets who came from the mountains of Ephraim. Uh, yeah, how about this? Can we give them some money? And uh, let's give them some name brand clothes like cashmere like to wear from time to time. Uh, so Naaman said, please take two talents. Here's some Gucci, some, some Louis Vuitton, and some Ferrag uh, Ferragamo. And um, uh, 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 give it to the young man. And tell Elijah I appreciate the healing in the water of uh, uh, the Jordan River. Okay? And so watch this. Verse 24. And when he came to the citadel, he took them uh, in their hands, stored them away in the house. So he hid them, in other words. And he let the men go and he departed. Now, when he came in and stood before the master, Elijah said, where did you go, Gehazi? And your servant said, I ain't going nowhere, you lying wonder you. Verse 26, and then he said to him, did not my what? Did not my what? How many of you downloaded the church app so you can read the Bible when you're in church and study it this, this, later on in this week? I'm telling you, things are going to change in our ministry. I, I cannot pass the people who don't want to be, who don't want to grow. I need you to grow. This, ain't, this is not an entertainment zone. The days of just getting a little cute sermon, go home and stay in your stuff. Uh-uh. Bible says, did not my heart go with you? Can you imagine that? You say you did one thing, you did this, that, and the other, but man, look here. We, so, we, we tight in ministry. We ace boom coon. We together now. We ride or die. We are know those who bear, uh, 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 labor, know those who labor among you. Spirit bear with them with spirit. Man, was not my heart with you. This may be a nine to five, a pay for play. This may just be a little Sunday morning gig, but man, let me tell you something. My heart bleeds for your family. I, I want you to be saved. I really want you to be a successful husband and a great dad. Ain't my heart nearly with you? Let's keep reading. So, interesting enough, watch this. And, 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 and then he said, uh, didn't let my heart go with you? And the man turned back from his chariot to meet you. Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing? Groves, vineyards, sheep, oxen, male, female, and all that stuff. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from the presence of leprous as white as snow. Okay, I'm almost finished. I want to build a case here. Old Testament, New Testament. Like two very, very opposite stories, but they had so much in common. Number one, they both took something that didn't belong to them. Ananias, Sapphira, you made a reputation and you made a cloud, you made a statement in front of all the people that you gave so much to the house, but you didn't have the heart of the house. You took for yourself. And, and, and honestly, you, you didn't have to do anything. But the fact that you presented yourselves as a generous person. Okay? Let's go over here to Gehazi. Gehazi, you should have left well enough alone. You had no fear in you that you were serving. A, and listen, this is ain't no any old body prophet. He was Elisha. But that somehow did not derail his thinking to think he could get over on God's man or on God's woman. Can you imagine the arrogance and just the brutal nature of, of being so egotistical? 
That money don't belong to you. It didn't even belong to the man of God. But now you're going to kill the church's reputation. And you're going to ruin the man of God's rep because you got greedy. All right? And consequently, the very thing that Naaman got healed from is now on, oh my God, Gehazi. Selfish deception and dishonesty versus being faithfully committed to the body of Christ. My time is almost up. Pastor, how do I have a heart for the house? I'm so glad you asked because my time cannot be completed until I give you some do's, some want to do's, some, 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 some reassurances. When you look at Ananias and Sapphira, here's a couple who really could have made a tremendous gain, but they broke the bond of oneness, solidarity, and unity. The question that Peter asks is, Ananias, why did Satan fill your heart to lie? The question asked to Gehazi, did not my heart go with you? The question to the, uh, Sapphira, how could you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? I'm reading a book right now by Frankel Victor, Vic, uh, Victor Frankel, uh, Man's Quest for Living or Meaningful Life. And there's a statement that says this, contemporary, psycholo contemporary psychologists tell about human trauma. Quote, what is not repaired is often repeated. What is not repaired is often repeated. May I add my church lingo to this? What is not repented of is often repeated. I got to close with these last, two these last two points. You asked the question today, why was this so lethal, so vicious, so egregious? What was so, what was so bad about this offense? You had to understand the church was going somewhere special but your greed got in the way. And I know you may say to yourself, well, certainly God's too big for one person's stuff. Well, not the God of Joshua chapter 7. You remember the sin of Ai? There was a man by the name of Achan. And Achan sat aside. He decided to do a little something on the side where nobody would know about it. But God, instead of dealing with Achan, he dealt with the whole church. I was there about a month ago here in this pulpit, and I began to share and sense and feel, you know what, too many, too many coincidences right now. Too many bad fortunes right now. Too many, hmm, that, that's interesting now. I said, nah, you know what's happening? There's the spirit of Akon in the house. The, the, the battle of AI, interesting, in AI. The battle of AI, here we are 5,000 years later still dealing with AI stuff. And God began to deal with me. And it started with the leadership. We have leaders who aren't being obedient, living right, praise team, music department. And I said, God, I, I, cannot, I can't let my pain be in vain. I can't let my experiences be in vain. But if, if I become like one of David's faults was, he never would discipline the kids. David would never reprimand wrong when it came to Absalom, when it came to Amnon and Tamar. You think about it. David was a man of God's heart. David was, he had a lot of these accolades. But one of David's bad problems was he never really came around and dealt with his kids. And that's why their kids ended up the way they were. And as a pastor, you know, there's a responsibility that says, hey, you praise and you build and you celebrate people and you, you tremendously bless the church as we continue to go forward. But every once in a while, there's something called church discipline and we can't allow sin to just, just a harvest in the house because you don't want to offend nobody and you don't want nobody to get upset and you don't want nobody to leave and all of that. Well, what happens is you create a culture and you foster a crowd where anybody can do what they want to do in the house. What makes us different from a club? What makes us different from a social organization? We're still supposed to be holy and, 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 and sanctified, right? And it's easy to say, oh, yeah, but what about you? And what about them? And what about this? What about, what about it? There's a price and there's a penalty for sin. That you do the time or you do the crime, you will do the time. Whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. Don't you think seeing a man reap from his sin should be a reason enough for you to get clean and get right? Or do you think for a moment you are exempt outside of the law of God? And so I begin to ask and say, God, what are you saying to the house? And he took me to scripture when the church would say, quit saying four months into the harvest. He said, the harvest is right now, but you got to clean the house. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers, they're so busy into their own world, they have no time for this. And you are the man that has to bring the word. And I said, God, that's not a popular thing to do. Well, it's not about being popular, it's about being faithful. 
and let God supply and provide. The early church was sacrificially giving. Why these people got greedy? Ananias evidently sold, and Barnabas did the same thing, right? But Barnabas did the right thing with his selling of land. Ananias and I decided to do different. In fact, the word, I thought this was interesting. Ananias, the Bible says he held back. The Greek word for held back was the word embezzle. It's the, it's, the, it's the word we get from embezzle. Why is that interesting? Because you can't embezzle from yourself, but you can't embezzle from someone else. What he was doing was he was embezzling of that which belonged to the church. Your time, your talents, your treasure. God blessed you. He graced you to share with the community of believers. But when you decide not to do these things, you're embezzling. Everybody okay so far? It's 1247. May I, may I have six more minutes? Can I have six more minutes? All right. May I have your time that God gave you just for <laughs> six more minutes? You know, oh boy. We may not have no members next week, so you can sit there wherever you want to sit next week. Now, let me help you out with this one. Let me help you out. And oh boy, here we go, here we go, here we go. And I have no security today, so I'm really out here by myself. Here we go. There are only a handful of faithful tithers in this church. You'd be surprised. You would think we're 70, 80% faithful tithers. I'm talking about faithful tithing. We're probably 40% at best. There was a time, I, I'm, I'm looking for people who've been here for a while. There was a time you couldn't sing on the praise team if you didn't tithe. You couldn't, you couldn't be a deacon, an elder. Now listen, you know you can't count no money if you ain't giving no money. Because if you steal from God, hello, you know you're going to steal from the church. If you didn't go to church on Thursday nights, you couldn't sing on Sunday mornings. I can hear, I, I, I can't hear none on this side of the room. I don't know why. I just, I'm just telling you. That's how it used to be. Used to be that way. Used to be. Somebody say used to be. Uh-huh. Now, let's do this. Let me go on this side of the room, okay? Now, 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 watch this, watch this. Now, Ananias and Sapphira, they embezzled. They took something that didn't belong to them. What does that sound like to me? It sounds like Malachi chapter 3. You remember in the scriptures? There you go. The Bible says, will a man rob God? And that is that your parents from the islands? I am so sorry I missed them. Can you bring them back next Sunday when I have a nice, sweet, cute message? Because I don't want them to question you when you get home. What, how, how, how do you stay going to that church over there? All right. God bless you. And that's mom and dad. Good to see you all from the islands. God bless you. All right. Notice what the word says. The Bible doesn't say, will a man steal from God? It says, will a man rob God? Now, what does that tell you and I? There's a difference. Make sure he's awake over in that corner. There's a difference. I didn't, I didn't call no name, but if you looked up, that's, you must have been the one I was talking about. There's a difference between stealing and robbing. You, you hear me, uh, young Vernon? You hear me, young Vernon? There's a difference between stealing and robbing. When a person steals, they take away. But when you rob somebody, you do it with intent and you do it with premeditation. This is why we don't fault a person who's hungry, run over here to the food line, and steal a hamburger when nobody's looking. Yeah, you're not saying nothing. When I was a kid, I loved when my mother would take me to the grocery store, right? Y'all remember the free cookies you used to get to the deli? You could really only get one. I'd come out there four or five of them. I guess you all can tell, right? You know, you, you remember the samples? You, you ain't supposed to get but one or two samples when you go to Sam's Club, right? I, I'd come out there with a whole handful of samples. Now, technically, that's not yours to take, okay? But if I'm hungry and if I stole it, you're not going to really fault me too bad. But if I've got a, a, a nine millimeter and I go hold somebody up and I violently rob them, well, the court says you're looking at three to five. Am I right? Because you did it with intent. You did it with um, uh, meditation. So there's a difference. We don't look favorably on a person who robs somebody versus somebody who stole because they was hungry. Everybody sit with me, okay? My question to me, if you all is this, if I'm not tithing, the Bible doesn't say I'm stealing from God. It says I'm robbing. I'm taking, I've meditated about it. I've contemplated about it. I'm doing this with intent. I know it's not right, but I'm going to do it anyway. So in the spiritual, I wonder, am I doing three to five? 
am I under a three to five curse or a three to five penalty because I won't be obedient to God? I, I just want to, I'm, I'm talking loud, I'm talking right. Because there are people who look the part when they come around the offering plate. They stand with the envelope, but ain't nothing in that envelope. And sometimes when it is something, it bounces. And they never get it right. And they dare you to say something. I've had to ask leaders in our church not to come back. As a leader, you can come sit as a member, but you can't come as a leader because you borrow money and you don't pay it back. You don't tithe. God blesses you with this amount, and you still give dollars. God gives you increase with that amount, and you don't give nothing. So you can go and lie and tell everybody you left because of that reason, this reason. The truth of the matter is I've asked you if you're going to serve because we're not equally yoked. We need to be equally yoked in ministry as elders, as pastors, as praise team, as musicians. So if you're not giving and you're robbing God, I can't be yoked to that because now I'm going to be an accomplice to the crime. And I don't want to do three to five. I don't want to do three. I don't want to do one. I want to be free and clear of all of the blessings that God has in store for me. Everybody okay so far? Y'all all right? So now let's, it begs to ask the question again. Is there a possibility if I'm not tithing, Consistently, consistently, am I doing time in the spirit? So no matter how much you make, you still don't have enough. Sounds like Haggai to me. Haggai chapter one. Haggai says, consider your ways, consider your ways, consider your ways. It's time to build the house. Not, not brick and mortar, not blueprints and, and budgets. No, it's time to, to, to advance the vision. But you say, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy making money. I'm too busy dating. I'm too busy socializing. I'm too busy online. And God said, wait a minute. How is it that you have time to build your own vision? You build your own ambition. You build your own stuff, but you have no time for God's house. He said, this is why you've got money bags with holes in them. Read the Bible. Y'all look at me like I'm making this up. Read the Bible. God says you have money bags with holes in them. And this is why you keep making more money, and yet you cannot pay your bills. Most of you in this room, are making more money than you've ever made, but at the same time, many of you all can't pay your bills. And Haggai says, consider your ways. I wish I could go on. I still got two pages of notes left. My time is up. Let's pick it up Thursday night. Would you stand to your feet? I wish I could go. I got so much more. I even got into the fear of the Lord, the faith in God, and the follow through. We got so much more, but I don't want to see you lose a spiritual battle because of disobedience and deception. You got to understand right now, at the end of the day, there was a sin of disobedience. All right? And I need you to hear me really, really close when I say this, because today it has to be a game changer. If you notice, we didn't come in with an offering at the first of the service and one at the end of the service, because I already knew what the word of the Lord is. I've got to trust that the Holy Spirit will prick your heart, convict your heart, and bring a conversion to your heart today. I said it once, in the first of the service, I said it twice in the middle of the service. Now, here's my third time. The greatest heart for the house is your generous giving. It is your consistent attendance. Someone argued me the other day. Well, not argued. Someone kind of contested me the other day and said, well, you know, people got to work. People got to work. People got to work on Thursday night. That's why people don't come to church anymore. I don't believe that. I don't buy that. Because some of those same people can go to the ball game when you sing. Some of the same people can go when you have a... A, a, a outing alright I got a video coming out this week you're going to have fun at it I'm going to make it real laugh, uh, laughable but I want when it comes to Thursday night and you have a problem coming to church just close your eyes and act like you've been invited to the buffet line in a free crab leg fest and someone paid your bill and then open your eyes and imagine you right in that parking lot you'll be just fine alright just close your eyes and just believe somebody gave you a, a ticket to the 100 section of Bank of America Stadium, open the night for the Panthers. Open your eyes and be right here in this parking lot and you have no problem. Because we're the same church. We're the same pastor. Same, same, same. Well, we, we're going to work on the music. We're going to work on the music. We're going to work on some of the things we need to work on, all right? But people can do what they want to do. Generous giving, consistent attendance, and faithful participation. We need you to get back in the game. We need volunteers for the youth. We dropped the ball horribly this, this summer with our youth department. I'm embarrassed. We have people go AWOL, people who leave without absence. Nothing, no nothing, no nothing. We've never been that way, never. But now we're so 
into ourselves. We ain't got no shame. Same few people still doing the sign ministry. We need more men to help. Well, it's too hot to put the tent up. But then white folk can go right over there and not only put the tent up, they teach in class under the tent. Every time I drop, y'all know I'm not lying. You know I'm not lying. Outside, am I telling the truth? When I drove up, that same Sunday school teacher with a suit on. That dude got a suit and a tie. Teaching, Sunday, teaching class under the tent outside. All we ask you to do is to put the thing up so we can have a welcome center. So what I'm saying is simply this. Let's give God's house our hearts. Because right outside these walls, there are men and women who are looking for hope. They shouldn't have to question us. They should be able to say, you know what? Man, there's a lot of good things going on. People are happy, excited. And, 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 and may I remind every one of you, because I can hear Peter talking now. Peter said this, Lord, remember, the, remember when, he, when he comes to Jesus and said, Lord, okay, got it. We've done all of what the preacher said. Everything that Pastor Stephen ramped and raved about and hollered about and cried about, we done did all that. And then, Sister Moore, he says, is there anything left for me? Just read the Bible. Peter says, is there anything left for us? What did Jesus say to him? He said, Peter, no man will have left mother, a house, car, land, sister, brother, that I won't restore in this lifetime and in the life to come. I'm here to tell every one of you, there will be nothing you will do for God's house that he won't repay you on. And I know some of us got this whole escapism, romanticism, I'm going to get mines when I get to heaven. You will, you will. Heaven's going to be all that and more. But God said if you live long enough and you live right, I'm, you're going to get a little bit of heaven on the earth. Because God needs and wants an example to show people what true faithfulness and loyalty looks like. I want to pray with you. I'm super excited about where we're at and where we're headed. Thursday night, uh, I've adjusted my schedule. Um, I've got some work and some business and some family stuff going on. I told my wife this morning, I have to be here on Thursday night. I just got to reroute some stuff so I can be in place. I beg of you. I, I plore. Well, it's dark. It's, it's not dark at 7 o'clock. It's not. Stop. Just stop with that. It's not. And if it was, it's dark when you go to the convenience store to get them lottery tickets. All right? All right? And by the way, stop playing the lotto. Just, just stop. Just stop all together. Just Tell your neighbor, neighbor, he, he, he talking to one of us. I'm not sure if it's me or you, but he's talking to one of us. Just, all right, this would be a good time to tell your neighbor, all right? If you ain't talking, you must be the one. Leave the lotto alone. Brother Reggie, can I get in that camera one more time? Leave, how much is the payout Tuesday night? 1.3 billion? After Tuesday night, leave. <laughs> no, no, okay, all right. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. You know, the Lord might want to move in a mysterious way. I'm just saying. Because look, if one of y'all win, pay your tithe. <laughs> and if you pay your tithe, all y'all who don't like me, all y'all can go. Uh, I just need one member who can pay that tithe, and all the rest of y'all can leave. I will be just fine preaching to one person, as long as that's the tithe-paying person. And we just be fine, all right? But the tithe person need to stay with the tithe. And make sure the check clear the bank, and then we'll be all right. Okay, now, what was that? What was that? I got distracted. Quit asking me all those questions, Brother Ron. I'm trying to get the track. Oh, yeah, no lottery. No, leave the lotto alone. So all I'm saying is this. Make Thursday night your destination. All right? We don't live in Hunters. We're not in Huntersville no more for the drive. It ain't 10 degrees outside. Um, we need you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to stay in the parking lot and talk as long as we can before it gets dark. I want you to hear the word of God. I want you to invite somebody. Bring the family out if you can. We're going somewhere great, but you're missing. Faithful, attendance, participation. We need your help. We should have a full band on Thursdays. And we're going to need that. We need singers, people who can actually sing. We need you. We're excited. Have a heart for the house. Head every head by the way.